So as part of our agenda, uh, as Chris pointed out, yeah, we, we work at the connection of so many different uh, federal clients. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit today on, the, on, on autonomy and autonomous systems, particularly our worldview, as Chris was talking about, what happens when these autonomous machines get deployed at scale, when taken out of the lab uh, and go out there into the field and really transform uh, agency missions. So the first segment that we're going to talk about today before we bring out the panel is to first uh, illustrate some of the things that we've encountered in our research that we think are fundamental elements, fundamental challenges, fundamental opportunities around the notion of deploying uh, autonomous systems at scale to solve uh, agency missions. So to do that, I'll be joined by uh, two colleagues, uh, James O'Hara, who is the manager of this beautiful lab that where Chris and I are broadcasting live from today, as well as uh, Dr. Mohamed Goli, who is our robotics lead uh, in our lab here at the Research Center. So uh, first, I'm going to give a, a little bit of insight about how we view the world of autonomous systems, more specifically, the challenges and opportunities that we see here from our vantage point, try to describe that. And then I'll turn it over to James and Mohammed, who have some uh, demonstrations they put together that illustrate some of these key challenges that I'll cover. All right, so first I'd like to level set a little bit on what we consider an autonomous system. Uh, so here I think the critical thing to know is that having machine an autonomous machine, a rover, a drone, a submersible, or a float platform, and performing uh, actions and missions that had been previously assigned to, to manned systems is a very interesting problem in and of itself. And there's lots of great stuff that we could talk about just in terms of autonomy there. But when you talk about moving out of the lab, and instead of searching, for example, a, a small space and starts uh, searching something very large, like the ocean, then you're going to need to have uh, the ability to scale up those capabilities. So another critical component is that the real world, unlike a lab, has a lot of other, has a lot of other entities in it. Some of them are humans, and some of them are other just machines, either unmanned or, or, uh, or partially autonomous, as Chris alluded to before. So the environment is almost never as clean or as simple as a, as a lab environment might uh, propose it to be when you're doing those first tests. And so uh, for us, uh, this notion of many machines at scale is not just strictly one kind of rover, one kind of drone, one kind of submersible, multiply by a million and throw them in the water or into service because the real world out there has a bunch of other machines in it too. Automated vehicles, drones, submersibles, float platforms, rovers, and it's very likely that those machines are going to interact with other machines that are unlike it, as well as with humans who may or may not uh, be aware of the presence or the, or, the, or the mission that those machines are performing. So we use this term machine broadly and conceptually throughout the day today to illustrate this heterogeneity component that we predict an autonomous system in the future to be one with many machines of, of very different types, uh, very different capabilities, sizes, weights, uh, and, and trust. And trust we'll talk about it in a minute. But altogether, an autonomous system is not just merely three rovers deployed together that can do simple actions and stay out of each other's way. An autonomous system to us is a self-organizing system uh, which contains many heterogeneous and connected machines all potentially working together, or at least trying not to get in each other's ways and, and operating safely uh, throughout. Okay, so, uh, so a clear goal for us is not just to create an autonomous system by collecting up autonomous machines and throwing them together and seeing what happens, but to create autonomous systems that are reconfigurable, resilient, uh, that, they, that can self-organize, dynamically based on the conditions that they encounter. Uh, I mean, no, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, right? Uh, and whether that's you know, a traffic signal plan uh, on a roadway system or actually in, in the battle space. So the ability for these systems to adapt is critical. And I'm going to kind of walk you through some of the elements of why we think these autonomous systems are the more, are, are, are indeed transformative and super powerful 
for our, uh, for our federal agencies in, in many different uh, uh, domains. The first is, again, as I point out, is that there's going to be a lot of heterogeneity in the system, and that's a strength. That should be a strength and can be leveraged as a strength throughout. Different machines, different uh, capabilities, and different value, right? So a drone, which is a couple hundred bucks, versus a large platform, which may be several million dollars, you want to have different risk profiles for those particular things. And that's not just on the military side, too. Similarly, if you, uh, if you have a, on the civilian sector, that same drone uh, looking and searching for something, there may be a much more expensive recovery uh, machine, which is used to clear, for example, traffic or deal with a hazmat spill. So these autonomous assets should be considered together as a self-organizing uh, system. And even if those machines can't always talk to everybody in the group. So we're not trying to deliver a monolithic worldwide capability of autonomous systems. So these machines should be able to organize themselves based on who they see around them in an ad hoc and powerful ways. Finally, this other point I wanted to make about highest value assets is that they self-organize with a sense of what the value of the individual uh, elements are, those machines, so that the appropriate machine with the appropriate capability with the appropriate risk profile can be committed at any particular time. All right, which leads me to a critical point. In order for all of this to work together, uh, one of the things that we have spent some time on and we think is critical uh, as an insight broadly for autonomous systems like we've just talked about is that there has to be a, a way of managing trust over time. So if you have a mechanism that says we've been assigning machines to do certain actions or to maneuver in a certain way, if you don't have a way of measuring how they perform against that, then you have a very, uh, you have a tough time managing risk uh, across the entire system. And so later on, James in particular in his demonstration is going to talk a little bit more about how we quantify and utilize trust, but this is a critical component. Without a system there, without a system that includes a form of trust, there is no way to be effective in the kind of reconfigurable, resilient, autonomous system that I've just described. So another point to make is that although the system is self-organizing, it doesn't exist for its own, just for its own sake. It's there to perform some human-derived action, and humans are still part of the system. And so there's a mechanism that we have to think about with these autonomous systems about what is the appropriate level of control or influence that any particular person should use or can use as a controller or just interacting with the system. And then finally, if all this pulls together, this is like the, the end of our worldview, if you have these multiple configurable autonomous machines working in a, as a self-organizing autonomous system, then you've released some incredible power uh, in all sorts of domains. Okay, so why do we have this, uh, why do we have this worldview and where did it come from? So, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that we've been working on this uh, as a research area over the last four years, uh, developing this worldview that I've just described to you. And in fact, uh, just a couple months ago in March, uh, this worldview and, uh, was rewarded with a patent by the, by the US uh, Patent Office uh, for its innovation. Uh, I'd only use it here to illustrate, you can, this is to, to pride a base to see where we come from in this space and why we view it the way we do. Because uh, the, the patent itself is a, is a mechanism for understanding how we see an autonomous system and the, uh, the, both the challenges and the opportunities to, uh, to making it a success. So around this diagram, I won't try to brief every part to it, uh, part, part of this to you because it is quite complicated. But what I will say in a couple of clicks here is that first off, there are uh, ways that we use to identify uh, what machines are nearby, this proximity boundary, what machines need to interact with each other. We have a number of innovative ways that we help the machines to, to self-organize. It's not the only way of doing this, but this is uh, one way that, that we have innovated to do it. Uh, and then the second, there's a way of, uh, we, we look at in terms of sensor and intent sharing. So once those machines sense, uh, form a group, then they have to also uh, sense share information with one another as well as their intent, where they plan to do, uh, in terms of where they would go and with the actions that they will take. Uh, again, trust is important in the collective map generation. Bahamas is going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, how they plan maneuvers and actions. How they verify, actually, 
the motions and the actions and how successful those things are in the teams that they have formulated or in the ad hoc collections of machines that have been formulated. So this is an important feedback because if there is no mechanism by which we say, well, that machine actually did perform the maneuver or did not perform the maneuver, uh, then there is no trust in the system. So verification is an important component of it. Uh, the management of trust has been a big focus for us. How those verification reports are turned into uh, uh, multi-dimensional array values uh, that influence future planning and uh, managing dual communications. Another critical component here is that when people uh, say, well, how do you do all this quickly enough? Uh, we have an important decision to make about identifying what needs to operate in a fast-moving space, fast space and in a slow-moving space. Finally, as part of our innovation, we demonstrate how blockchain or distributed ledger technology can be utilized uh, to help this function, the whole system function, in a decentralized way. Okay, so why did I tell you about that? I tell you about it because that's where we have been living for the last three or four years in our worldview about trying to reach forward towards a, a specific type of autonomous system that, as I pointed out before, is resilient, reconfigurable, has ad hoc components and has the ability for humans to step in and out of control of that system at various levels to achieve the mission. Okay, so now we could try, what's hard to do is to demonstrate how this works with a million machines, right? <laughs> that, that's hard to do, uh, but what we can do and what we're gonna move into now is some demonstrations uh, conducted primarily here in this lab environment, not live today, but in, in a previous session, where we illustrate some of these critical components of what I just talked about. Now we're gonna use some relatively simple machines to do so, some rovers and drones, uh, but I'd like you to imagine, depending on what is your use case of interest, these rovers and drones doing things maybe as different kinds of uh, machines. Uh, they, are, they are essentially conceptual stand-ins for any of the kinds of autonomous machines that I talked about uh, earlier on in my, in my presentation. Uh, but with that, I'm just going to give you a quick lineup of how it's going to roll out. First, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, machine orchestration. James O'Hara will lead that, uh, including diving a little deeper on why we think trust is so important and why trust in terms of machine trust differs from human trust. And then uh, Dr. Goley will take over uh, to do a, a next demo, which shows how uh, machines that perceive the world differently from each other, based on their sensor arrays, based on their ability to maneuver, uh, how they can generate a shared uh, situational awareness uh, by uh, collectively uh, providing a map. And then last, James has some very good and interesting uh, observations to make based on some of our uh, attempts to allow the humans to interact with these machines uh, at very different levels, depending on what's required. All sort of couched in terms of what are these challenges, and if we can overcome these challenges, you know, what will be the benefit in terms of transformational capability? All right. So with that, I see my time is about up. So I would invite uh, James O'Hara, I believe who, yeah, James has the first one here. James, if you can hear the sound of my voice coming to us from a, a remote location, not in the lab today, uh, please take over and uh, you can show us the, the demo. All right, thank you, Carl. Um, yeah, so as Carl said, our first demo is the, the collective maneuver planning and earn trust uh, demonstration. Uh, so the first part of this, these are three part videos. Um, so this is a little bit of context to set it up. The first two will use our two small fully autonomous rovers. Uh, in this case, they'll have conflicting goal points. So you see in the image in the bottom left, rover A and yellow, the yellow rover you'll see in the video is trying to go from the top down to the bottom point, uh, while, the ro while rover B, the one in blue, is trying to go across, straight across from right to left. Uh, this creates an issue where if there's no communication between rovers, in this case, in our isolated autonomy, they can only use their infrared sensors to perceive the world around them. So they have eight infrared sensors around their top. They use that to uh, identify obstacles and stop and try to change their path to move around them. Uh, but since there's no communication, as you see in the image on the right, as they both move towards the center, following the ideal path to their goal point, they'll both meet in the middle and they have no way of knowing what they're going to do next. So with that, we'll get started with our first video. So this will be a top-down view you'll see of our two rovers. As you see, the yellow rover begins moving to its goal point, as does the blue rover. 
And at the last second, the Blue Rover is able to identify that there's an obstacle in its way. Uh, so like you can see, isolated autonomous systems, they can work very effectively. You have these sensors, they have a lot of code in them to make sure they work safely and they don't collide. However, one of the issues we really see is in a lot of these cases, like right there, where they have to move in very close quarters, make tight maneuvering, and trying to do that based on only the information they have is very difficult. Uh, so in that case, the blue and the yellow rover were trying to go basically to the goal point that the other one was occupying at the time. That means they're moving right, in, right into each other. Uh, there's a lot of wasted time. There was a small collision, as you saw. And then there was a lot of wasted time where they both were right next to each other and had to figure out, well, how do I get around this giant obstacle that's right next to me, let alone having to then deal with the fact that that obstacle is trying to also do the same thing. So in some of these cases, you can see uh, there are a lot of benefits to isolated autonomous operations. There's a lot of time where you'll be able to see that your autonomous decision engine is working correctly. It's following the path that it's setting out correctly. It's seeing obstacles. It's not hitting them. It's avoiding them. Uh, and in some of these cases, you can see like right here where they're again in close maneuver, they're able to actually work around each other without an, uh, an incident like before. And the blue rover is able to get to its goal point while the yellow rover is getting to its goal point. And so you might say, if you're testing out autonomous decision engines a thousand times, it might do that maneuver it did down there a thousand of those times and get it right every time. And then the thousandth first time is when all of a sudden there is a collision. It's so difficult to build an autonomous decision engine that can account for every single situation that you're going to encounter, especially in, the real, in a real world environment and not just this laboratory conditions like we have here. So again, you can see this is another case where the yellow and the blue rover are close together. The yellow rover made a, a small collision and is now difficult, having difficulty maneuvering around the blue rover. And one of the other uh, problems we see with this is not just like a safety concern where they're colliding, but an inefficiency of movement. Because now the blue rover is stuck because it had the yellow rover in front of it. It doesn't know that that yellow rover was a moving obstacle. It just knows it was in the way. And now it needs to sit and wait until its sensors can confirm safely that there is no longer an obstacle in its way. And by sitting there now, it's getting right in the way of our yellow rover, which has collided again. So those are some of the main issues that we see with isolated autonomous, uh, autonomy. autonomy. Uh, it's difficult to program for every potential situation. Uh, sensors can present inaccurate or incomplete information. And if you're relying only on your own, you can't share information. Uh, you're only, you have to work on that inaccurate and incomplete information to make decisions. Uh, Close-in maneuvers can lead to collision, even with safety buffers and low speeds. You, know, you can't account for every single time. So that's why you have to travel at those low speeds, because if you have that collision, uh, you, you could be hopefully be a safe collision. Uh, but that then leads to a lot of inefficient and wasted and slower movement than necessary trying to navigate around these unexpected obstacles. So our second demonstration that we have here is Nobles' patented orchestrated autonomy standing in for the idea of just general autonomous machine teaming and the benefits that we see from it. Uh, so in this case, it'll be the same to the yellow and the blue rover in the same constrained space as they were before. Uh, but in this case, the machines will communicate their identity, their position, and their intent. By, what we mean by intent is their plan path every five seconds, they'll send that. And then if they change their path for any reason between every five seconds, they'll send out an instant path to notify the other vehicle what change has been made. Uh, when they do that, they then coordinate their action uh, and one vehicle will give the other one priority in space and time if they're trying to go for the same spot. So again, you see in the bottom left, the same image as before, where A and B are, are gonna try to both cross through the middle following their ideal path to their goal points. But on the right, in this case, we can see that they've negotiated that uh, from time zero to five, the blue rover and the yellow rover are safe in those first two green spots, but then the yellow rover will stay there for the next five seconds while the blue rover has priority to move through the space and then gets to its goal point. The yellow rover then will get to its goal point later on as, a, as space is cleared out and moved. That way you prevent those conflicts. So this is our orchestrated autonomy demo. Again, we have the same top-down view. Uh, you'll see that the yellow and the blue rover both start moving until they have that communication. You see the yellow rover then stops and moves away from the conflicted space, allowing the blue rover to immediately get across to its goal point. In this case, again, they're going back. They're going to both go try to go to the same goal point in the bottom, 
That communication allows the blue rover to play priority for the goal point. And since it's occupied, the yellow rover switches goals and moves up to the one at the top instead. Uh, so in that way, it knows that instead of having the inefficient movement of going all the way down to the bottom of the screen, or the left of the screen, before realizing that the blue rover was also going there, it knew way earlier, was able to adjust and find a different goal point and achieve, achieve its objective. Uh, you can see in this case that they're now trading off. Uh, again, the blue rover pays for priority. The yellow rover switches goal points. Uh, there's a lot fewer close-in maneuvers because they're having this communication and they know that the other rover is going to be there and they don't have to work, you know, to be, you know, they don't have to get so close to realize where the other vehicle is. The real backbone of this, though, as Carl mentioned earlier, is trust. Uh, these two vehicles, if they were to work just with simple binary trust, it'd be very difficult. In a binary trust, either you trust everybody or you trust nobody. If you trust anybody, everybody, every information you're told, that can pre prevent, uh, present a serious cybersecurity risk. If you trust none of the information you're told, you're just working in isolated autonomy. Uh, so you need some way with a granularity to understand the differences between autonomous decision engines and how much you can trust the information they're telling you and how well they can follow through with it. So in Noblis's patented orchestrated autonomy system, the way we do that is using a distributed ledger and peer reports. So as the blue and the yellow rover are working through this space and interacting with each other and coordinating their actions, they're also rating each other on how well they are following the plans that they've come up with. So in these cases, when the blue rover is asking for priority in the space at the bottom, uh, it, the yellow rover is then rating it on how well it's using that space. So in this case, the blue rover did follow the path it planned to, so the yellow rover would give it a positive rating. In the future, in some cases, if the blue rover asked for priority, but then didn't actually use the space in the amount of time expected, the yellow rover could give it a negative rating for that time. And so in that case, uh, with those ratings adding up, you can then have a ledger for each vehicle with all of its individual peer reports that can be combined into a single score that can tell you the trustworthiness of a vehicle. So then we could introduce an unfamiliar machine to these two uh, autonomous robots that's also operating in the same space autonomously. And it would instantly know how trustworthy the information that the blue and the yellow rover were giving it uh, based on that peer reports that they've been giving each other throughout this demonstration that we've seen. Uh, and in that way, it can make better decisions based on the information it's being shared with. Uh, it can see obstacles better. It can know where the vehicles are going. It can move, they can, co as they increase their trust, they can move slightly closer together. Uh, they can move a little bit faster because they know that they can trust when a vehicle tells them that they're going to be in a specific point, a specific time, that that will be true. So overall, as you can see, uh, this is a lot better uh, than we're seeing from the isolated vehicles as they're having that distance between them. Uh, and not really, we haven't seen any collisions yet. We haven't even seen very many uh, close-in maneuvers. So in summary, our coordinated action increases the overall network efficiency and safety. As you see that video, even though when there are times when an individual vehicle was taking a slightly less efficient route for a brief period of time by giving up priority in the space, Overall, they're getting to their goal points a lot more frequently and a lot more quickly and a lot more safely as we didn't have collisions as we had in the isolated autonomy example. Uh, the machines giving up the priority, like I said, they temporarily follow less efficient paths, but overall they move more efficiently in the space and time. Uh, and then we have that backbone of trust, the efficiency and the safety improve as the trust increases over time. And as I said before, if you were to bring in an unfamiliar machine that had never interacted with those two vehicles before, it would still know how trustworthy the information is being shared with it based on those trust scores that had been built up and earned by these two vehicles prior uh, previously. Uh, and so our final part of this is our multimodal machine teaming. So the first two examples were using our ground rovers, but as Carl said before, these are really just a stand in for any sort of vehicle you can see. And one of the other benefits you can see with autonomous machine teaming and orchestrated autonomy in specific uh, is that it does not need to work with a specific mode. It can work across modes of mobility. So for this uh, example, we're going to use a drone and a ground worker working uh, ground, ground rover working cooperatively to collect an object of interest. Uh, so the drone will be able to fly over obstacles and use its camera to lo locate the object of interest. 
While the ground rover will be able to use its uh, arm to be able to drive around and pick up the object of interest to take it to a neutral location. The common language of autonomous machine teaming allows for communication and sharing across the two different modalities. And you'll see, see the machines coordinate the task allocation to the most. So you can see the drone is taken off on the, on the right side of the screen and is able to fly above the obstacles and localize the object of interest. It then takes that location and is able to share it to the ground rover as they share a common mapping and sort of understanding of the environment. The ground rover is then able to autonomously maneuver through the boxes presented as obstacles to it and is able to drive around them and get to the can. Uh, and then it can use its arm to pick up the object of interest uh, once it's able to identify it with its camera. All of this is being done fully autonomously. All of this is being done by the drone, the rover, assigning themselves tasks and sharing information with each other. The only thing that we did is before the demo was set was to tell them that the mission was to identify this object of interest and pick it up. And they were able to fully autonomously, as a team, finish the res complete that mission uh, together without any additional input from us. So with that you know, summary, uh, orchestrated autonomy, as you can see, applies across modalities and competitive and cooperative missions. In our first two examples, those uh, vehicles were working competitively to try to get to their goal points as quickly as possible in a shared space, but were able to coordinate still by using orchestrated autonomy. In our last case, it was a cooperative mission, but they still use the same principles to succeed. Uh, and a team of heterogeneous autonomous machines can coordinate to accomplish missions that would be difficult for a single machine to do. You know, our drone and our rover there, they can bring different aspects of, you know, different positives to the team, but they wouldn't be able to accomplish all of that on their own as successfully as they can together. And with that, Carl, I'll pass it uh, back to you. Great, thank you, James. I think we had a little dramatic music in the background there, a little bit, that's, uh, but we can still hear you well, I believe. All right, so, um, so that was James' demonstration. I think hopefully everyone got the, from, from the takeaway there is that you, you can't have priority without trust. And without priority, you don't have the capability to do any sort of self-organization or intent sharing itself becomes a, uh, a moot point, right? So, so we kind of jumped ahead to, the, to some critical components related to why we think trust is important. But trust also influences not only uh, how maneuver plans are generated and where they go, but also how much we trust and how we integrate maps from multiple kinds of machines. So in this particular case, uh, we're going to throw it to Muhammad. Uh, we, in James' demonstration, we kind of done all the mapping already in those demonstrations. Now we're going to take a step back to talk about this important step, which is how do you generate a map and then utilize that map uh, for multiple machines to, to utilize uh, in a space where an available map is only can be drawn by the machines uh, that are together rather than from some third party. So with that, I'll invite my colleague, uh, Muhammad Goli to take the screen. Muhammad, if you're out there. Sure. Uh, Muhammad, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? loud and clear. Yeah, we got you. All right. All right. Thank you, Carl. Uh, as you heard about uh, operation of autonomous machines in shared spaces, I will go over several functional challenges and requirements for these machines to operate in such spaces. So there are different autonomy components necessary for machines to be able to work autonomously in shared spaces, starting with the knowledge of machines about environment. We cannot assume that a detailed map is available for autonomous machines. And even if we, if one specific map is available, we must account for changes in the environment, including new static and dynamic objects in the space and other machines. SLAM or simultaneous localization and mapping is a common approach for an autonomous machine to explore an unknown environment and build a map of explored areas while localizing itself with respect to the environment. Next step uh, is for the map to be provided to a localization package so that the machine localizes itself with respect to this known map. And finally, knowing where we are uh, within the map 
the robot should uh, be able to plan its way through the obstacles and reaching its destination. And that is the autonomous navigation component illustrated in, in this slide. So let me uh, discuss the basics of Islam here and some of the challenges in this space. The problem of Islam and creating a consistent map of an unknown environment depends on different factors, including the environment, sensor availability, and computational requirements. Different Islam techniques exist, as such are uh, particle filter pairing-based algorithms, such as uh, G-mapping, and graph optimization-based techniques, such as Google Cartographer, and uh, specifically, graph-based optimization methods are very popular uh, for Islam. And I will uh, talk a little bit about the basic idea behind, behind graph-based optimization. So there are two uh, main components. Uh, there is uh, the sensor-dependent process processes that uh, basically uh, comprise the front end of the uh, Islam. Uh, basically, what we do with this uh, sensor-dependent processing is that we estimate the uh, motion of the rover with respect to the environment, and we also estimate the obstacle locations uh, using the sensors and different uh, dead reckoning techniques that exist. And when we have this information, in the back end, uh, which is the sensor-independent processes, we register pose graphs, and uh, we do graph optimization to create a consistent map of the, uh, uh, the, of the environment. So why the optimi optimization-based techniques are popular? When uh, the amount of data to process becomes too large, graph optimization techniques based on a scan matching algorithm become more suitable because they are faster and when different types of sensor information are fused, such as like LiDAR information, IMU, GPS, and wheel odometry, then this class of methods generate more consistent maps. Uh, loop closure constraints uh, could also be used with this uh, class of techniques to help the consistency of building map of larger uh, spaces. So because these approaches are computationally more suitable for uh, larger areas, and if we can incorporate more sensors, then a more robust map of a larger environment uh, could become feasible. However, uh, a lot more parameters tuning and calibrations are necessary, which is not a trivial task. So here you can uh, see how we basically build a map of the basement of the Noblis headquarters where Chris and Carl are coming live from based on a number of sensors that are all prone to uh, drift and drift errors, but are all working together to create a map that looks consistent. This is basically not a trivial task to create a consistent map of a larger GPS denied environment only based on dead reckoning techniques and local sensors. As you can see, sub maps of uh, all the different rooms and hallways are created and correctly patched together as the rover explores and scans new spaces. Lines are parallel and different spaces are patched together nicely and the overall map looks nice and consistent compared to the actual plan of the building. So for this type of uh, Islam algorithm, two subsystems work together to produce this map, the local Islam and the global Islam. Local Islam basically generates a series of submaps which are locally consistent, but uh, drift over time. And the global Islam finds loop closure constraints between submaps uh, to produce uh, basically a, a, a global a consistent map. It executes loop closure by matching scans of sensor data, particularly the LiDAR data against the submaps. And other sensors such as IMU, odometry, uh, and in some cases, GPS could be used uh, to attempt to get the most consistent global map. Here, when we build the map, uh, we, we can use it for autonomous navigation. Here is the rover in action using the map we previously created. The map needs to get updates as new static and dynamic obstacles appear so that the rover can plan its trajectory 
while avoiding uh, new obstacles. It goes through two stages again, uh, the global planning and local planning. In the global planning stage, the navigation algorithm tries to find a collision-free, kinematically feasible path from a start to goal while skipping the differential or dynamic constraints. And this is basically how to plan an optimal path from a start to finish without any collision. It's sometimes the case that the robot per perceives itself as a stock. Then it should perform a recovery behavior, in this case by rotating in place, uh, to, clear, uh, to, to clear out the space. In the local planning stage, on the other hand, we use path, uh, path smoothing uh, to meet the differential and dynamic constraints for a shorter horizon and produce the suitable velocity commands for our rover. It could be the case where there is a path in the global map that does not exist anymore because it's either blocked by a new obstacle or there is another machine on the way. So the robot will still need to drive along the path until it can observe the problem and plan around it via the local plan. As you can see, uh, the robot could uh, successfully use the map and autonomously get to its destination. And now we see the uh, rover on its way back from the um, mail room here at Noblis uh, to, to the lab. On the right, you can see the map that we created in a previous uh, stage. Uh, the rover is now using the map basically to navigate its way uh, all the way to the lab. And if the parameter tunings are done carefully and successfully, then you can see it can go through narrow spaces such as the lab entrance. So, uh, we discussed some of the functional challenges, uh, some of the functional challenges to achieve autonomy of machines. We discussed SLAM for localization and mapping. We briefly discussed autonomous navigation and path planning. And now I will talk about some other challenges that need to be addressed for a more specific use case. Beside the autonomy of individual vehicles, let's see what it takes for a group of uh, autonomous machines to do coordinated searching of an area trying to find an object of interest and retrieving it. As machines are searching the environment, they need to individually perform a SLAM and autonomous localization and navigation. However, they need to coordinate uh, with each other efficiently in uh, building a global map and use this as a reference for their search and recon activities. Moreover, for the use case uh, I just described, the team requires at least one capable machine to manipulate objects and retrieve uh, those objects if, if necessary. So you see a number of new challenges for a coordinated recon mission, and those are creating a global map, cooperative object detection, classification, and localization, and object manipulation. I will discuss uh, these challenges uh, a bit further in the uh, next slides. So creating a global map of the environment using individual robot maps is another functional challenge when working in a shared space with multiple machines working as a team to search and map a larger space. This is an active area of research at Noblis where we are testing different techniques for merging 2D occupancy grids and 3D point clouds to create a global map for a team of heterogeneous machines. This problem is also known as a multi-machine slam problem where we leverage the diverse uh, capabilities of heterogeneous machines to create a global map by merging the local maps built by individual machines via different sensors. One interesting approach we are taking is to measure occupancy grids that are created by different sensors, such as LiDAR and stereo cameras, which can be considered as a multi-machine, multi-modal SLAM problem. And other form of maps are also, such as like feature-based maps and topological maps can also be considered depending on the specific use case. So another, um, another challenge area for the example use case presented in previous slides is the ability of the heter heterogeneous machines to not only detect obstacles for navigation purposes, but also to detect objects of interest, classify them, and also localize them, and then identify those on the global map. The challenges in this area are twofolded. One, to implement a framework for fast and near real time object detection and classification. And second challenge is uh, on how to effectively implement data fusion 
techniques to benefit from a range of sensors to help us meet our requirement. Here you can see two side-by-side -side demonstration of LiDAR-based and camera-based object detection and classification, detecting objects of interest in our autonomy lab. So on the uh, left, you see a LiDAR-based basically detection that also localized objects. On the right, you see a camera-based detection. And the overall goal is to be able to uh, fuse these two type of detection together to have a rich detection. So in the use case, uh, we described where a team of machines have created a global map for autonomous uh, navigation and searching. If we successfully detect object of interest, it's now time to approach the object of interest and manipulate it and retrieve it. In this demonstration, we are using a robotic arm with an eye in hand camera and visual servoing techniques to detect an object with arbitrary shape, localizing it and sending its pose to the robotic arm for retrieval. In nutshell, our sensor in this case, a stereo camera produced a dense point cloud, which is a 3D point cloud representation of the world. We then downsample our point cloud, apply different filters to have a uniform point cloud. Uh, and we'll then we do some segmentation to identify a winning cluster, which would be our object of interest and eventually estimate its pose. The Cartesian pose is then sent to the robotic arm so that the arm can come up with specific optimal joint angles for approaching the object of interest and eventually pick it up and deliver it to a desired location. And in this final uh, demonstration, uh, we show how all the described autonomy components are integrated to autonomously explore and map the environment and then use this map to navigate uh, to the object of interest and retrieving it using the robotic arm. The main difference in this demo compared to the previous one that uh, we demonstrated is that to create the map, uh, the rover is in autonomous exploration mode where a, a specific uh, algorithm uh, named frontier based exploration technique is used to greedily explore the environment, perform SLAM, and create the maps until no frontier could be found. As you can see, the rover is autonomously exploring an unknown plotter environment with all sorts of different objects in the lab space so that we could actually test the robustness of the localization, navigation, and sensor system in mapping uh, the environment and avoiding obstacles in a random unknown indoor space. After we finish exploring the environment autonomously and we create the map, it's now it's time to use the map. So as you can see, the rover is uh, basically uh, exploring new spaces. And when it makes sure that there is no more uh, space to explore, it uh, you know complete the map and it's then we can then use and also create the map of that space. And then we can use that map to uh, basically retrieve the objects. When the machine uh, arrives at the target position, now the machine is sent, is sent to, to the target position. And when it arrives at uh, that uh, position, the robot will start retrieving the object of interest using the autonomous manipulation techniques we discussed previously. It uses its stereo camera uh, vision sensor to create a 3D point cloud representation of its field of view, apply a number of different pre-processing, processing and post-processing techniques, including segmentation to detect the object of interest and localize the center point and then attempt to reach and pick the object and deliver it where it should be delivered. So this was a brief introduction to several functional challenges being robust uh, multimodal SLAM, cooperative map creation, sensor fusion for fast object detection, classification, and localization, vision-based adaptive object manipulation, and autonomous uh, ex exploration of unknown environments. Uh, thank you for listening. And with that, I turn it over back to you, Carl. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Mohammed. I'm going to share my screen again here. So. I think a critical thing that Mohammed illustrated there is, is this a capability of the machines to operate independently. Uh, and in many cases, map, assign uh, tasks, and then conduct 
of specific and complex tasks associated with the capability of the individual machine. Uh, but before we get too sort of thrown into what can the machines do by themselves, remember that they're still doing things for us, right? Uh, humans are the, the, the drivers and the generators of the use cases. And in some cases, in many cases, we don't, we want to make sure that the humans are included appropriately in the, uh, in the autonomous machine system so that they can interact in an appropriate way at the right level or when needed. And so those requirements are actually quite different. Uh, and the ability to manipulate, uh, influence, or otherwise control a relatively large machine team at scale is the topic of our next, uh, oh, I forgot to advance the slide, our next demonstration from James O'Hara. Well, I, I told you roughly what I was going to say, here's the slide. Uh, but with that, uh, we're going to throw it to, to James to show how we incorporate human interaction at different kinds of levels uh, into machine teams doing complex tasks. James? Thank you, Carl. Uh, give me one second. First time I tried to share, it didn't share the right thing. Okay, perfect. So as Carl said, our next part is our human and autonomous system interface and engagement. Uh, so the way we define human autonomous machine interaction levels, we have four different here. Uh, we have human in the loop where the human is performing all the actions uh, and they're completely in control. There's almost no autonomy, no autonomy there at all. They might have some uh, sensors that provide the human information to how they should act, but there's no autonomous decisions being made. Human on the loop where automation performs some functions while human monitors and can choose to intervene at any time and the human still exerts control while still allowing the autonomous system to move on its own at some times. Uh, human over the loop where the automation performs almost all functions and the human is able to just provide oversight and high level guidance. Uh, the human manages them but does not control. Uh, so that's assigning a mission but not a specific task to carry out that mission would be an example. Uh, and then finally, human out of the loop, where the automation performs all the functions with human having no awareness or ability to intervene in any way. Uh, and the automation has total control under initial authority granted by the human. So what we focus, we've been focusing on here at Noblis mostly has been in our middle two cases, the human on the loop and human over the loop. Uh, so our first demonstration that I'll have for you today is remote monitoring of autonomous machines. So in this case, we'll still have our, our same two small autonomous rovers. Uh, they'll be navigating the same constrained space, but we've added additional obstacles as well. Uh, the human being will be present in the physical space, but will represent an idea of being in a remote location. Uh, and so he'll use only visual and auditory inter interfaces to monitor the actions and the perception of the machines uh, without any physical identification or vision of what the machines are doing, which you'll see in a second in the video what I'm talking about. So again, as you see, we have on the left, we'll have our two fully autonomous rovers. Uh, in our bottom right is our human participant, Shihan. He's using our visual and auditory interface. As you can see, the two autonomous vehicles are directly behind him. He can have, he has no physical way of seeing or knowing what they're doing. He's only using the view that he sees in the top right there of the vehicles moving across the screen. Uh, the, I, the green bars represent the heat, the uh, obstacle detection that they're performing, uh, and the blue dots represent their intent, the path that they're planning to move along. Uh, so in this way, what we want to prevent is the idea of you know, human out of the loop. If you send out, a, you, know, you could there are a lot of good use cases for remote autonomous vehicles, you know, sending them into dirty, dangerous situations that you don't want to place a human being in. However, if you just send out an autonomous machine team and say, go complete this mission, and then they come back with some data, it's very difficult for you to know, one, you know, how, what's the reliability of that data? What did the autonomous machine team actually do? Did they actually complete it successfully? So like some of these cases where you saw that yellow rover was stuck by that obstacle for a long time, if we're not observing them directly as they're working, uh, that makes it hard to mitigate situations like that or in these other cases where the yellow and the blue rover have gotten a little too close together, we would want a situation where maybe the human being could even directly intervene and control one of those rovers to make sure they can get through and navigate that situation successfully. But even overall, we want to be able to monitor, see how they're collecting the data they're collecting, how they're interacting with the world around them, 
how they're trying to accomplish these missions. Uh, and so our next demonstration, like I mentioned, is the, idea, the ability to also perform remote intervention and control. So in this case, one of the autonomous, one vehicle will be autonomous, that'll be the yellow one, uh, and one machine will be remotely controlled by Shihan, uh, that's the blue one. So he'll be able to help the autonomous machine navigate difficult situations before returning to control. So this is a specific example where Shihan will have control of the, of the rover the entire time, but it is illustrative idea where he could monitor an entire autonomous machine team and then when one of those vehicles has an issue, it could quickly ask for intervention. He could intervene quickly and then pass control back to the autonomous decision engine and then wait until another member of the team might need help as well while still performing the monitoring actions that we saw in the previous demo. So in this demonstration, again, as you can see in the left, you'll see our top-down view of our autonomous yellow rover and human-controlled blue rover. Again, Shihan is in the bottom right. You can see his back is completely to the other two vehicles, he can't see what they're doing. He's only driving using that top right view, which is in the first person view now. You could see the yellow rover drive through it at the beginning there. Uh, and now Shihan is at the goal point and is turning around. One of the other things you'll see is those goal, the waypoints moving in front of him, showing where he's uh, tried to get, where the goal point he's trying to get to is. Uh, he can also see the waypoints of the other autonomous vehicle in case they're gonna be in a close situation that allows him to maneuver and make sure he's not in the way of the autonomous vehicle uh, as he's doing right now. Uh, he also can see those green bars re representing the obstacles so that he knows not to drive into the obstacles. Uh, so Shihan is attempting to get to all three of the goal points of the blue rover successfully, all while doing this remotely. He's gotten to two. Uh, as you might also notice, the yellow rover is stuck again because it's gotten too close to the obstacles. So that's another example where, you know, you might have some autonomous recovery actions like Mohammed was showing earlier, but in some of these cases, the autonomy engine might not be able to recover. And that's a perfect example of when you'd want the human be able to drive it as well. As you can see, Shihan has reached the third goal point and got to all of them together. So that was working in a situation where you're remotely, but in all, a lot of other cases, you might be working side by side with an autonomous vehicle. And it's very difficult for human beings to have a shared situational awareness with an autonomous vehicle in the same way that they would with a human being. Even with physical presence, you can't use the same sort of language, gestures, you know, same sort of visual confirmation. You don't know, you know, the way your eyes work works fairly similar to the way another human being's eyes work, but they might not work at all similarly to how the sensors on an autonomous vehicle work. Uh, so in this case, we have a participant wearing an augmented reality headset, and there'll be one autonomous machine with them in the space using a depth camera to map the area. The participant will need to complete a hands-on activity. It's cap cup stacking and unstacking, just a representative activity of something that would require total concentration and full attention on his part. He can't be distracted by the uh, world around him, and he needs both of his hands to complete it. The autonomous machine will need to perform reconnaissance and look out for malicious actors, perform mapping, collect data for the human beings that he knows as he's moving through the space uh, that it's safe. And then the participant will use the AR to see what the autonomous machine sees and to give the machine high level instructions. So this is our CUPS demonstration. Uh, so again, we have Shihan, he's now working our, wearing our augmented reality headset. The augmented reality gives him a view of what the autonomous machine is seeing. So the, the point clouds being generated in 3D by that autonomous machine could be mapped to obstacles, or if you have our other, our other rovers, just those IR heat bars that you saw before, could map where obstacles are and also detect if there's something unexpected in the environment. Uh, Shihan, you can see, also just performed a gesture there. In that case, what he was doing is he created a waypoint that he could then place into the world, in the augmented reality world, that then got translated into a real world GPS coordinate that was then sent to the autonomous vehicle. And the autonomous vehicle then knew the goal point of where Shihan wanted it to currently be mapping. So as you can see, Shihan generally sends the vehicle ahead one space, one table to map the environment that he's about to move to, to see if there's anything interesting there. Uh, and then once he's confirmed that he's good with that space, uh, he'll then create a new waypoint and then place it somewhere in the environment the other benefit that you can see here is that Shihan's able to perform that these actions while on the move. One of the issues we've seen with previous uh, in-field systems 
for human and autonomous machine interaction is that you, they use fixed screens or tablets that require a person to look down and click through it with their hands. That's a lot of actions that you can't really do on the move. You can't really do suddenly. You kind of only use it for planning. And then once you're in a situation, you stop. The benefits we see with augmented reality is that Shihan can always look up and see what the autonomous vehicle is seeing and doing, quickly interact with it in a very natural manner where he's just creating, a, you know, using gestures to create a waypoint, place it in the world as if he's really putting it in that space. And then the, the autonomy does the rest of the work to do the mapping for him. So it's a lot easier to do on the move, a lot easier to kind of pay attention to what you're doing. And so one of the other key issues here is making sure that the amount of information presented to Shihan is enough for him to know and be able to make good decisions based on the what's being collected by the autonomous machine, but not so much that it's overwhelming, that it's distracting, that it creates an undue burden. What we don't want is him to become fatigued quicker because not only is he doing this physical task, but then he's doing all of this interaction with the autonomous machine. So that's why we try to unload as many tasks as we can onto the autonomy engine. And we try to make it as simple as possible for Shihan just to get the quick information that he needs. And then he can look away, focus on the physical tasks that he is doing at that time, working with the cups without having to pay any attention to the autonomous vehicle. Like right now, you can see he's clearly paying attention to the cups, making sure he stacks them correctly. Uh, and then issue we would see is if we were presenting him too much information and it was overwhelming his field of vision, it would be very difficult for him to com be completing this task correctly every single time. So as you can see, you can place the, uh, the waypoint in a lot of different manners. It's whatever works best for him, whatever works best on the move. Uh, and if we were to see a malicious actor suddenly appear behind him, uh, you would see that. Um... So that was the last one that we could see. Uh, our advanced interfaces uh, required for humans and machines to share situational awareness. Interfaces should provide necessary information without distracting the user or increasing fatigue. And interfaces should provide natural, intuitive control structures. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Carl. Awesome. Thank you, James. Um, I always enjoy watching uh, Xi'an do the uh, cup stacking while he's trying to control the uh, the rover. I think that's always a, a really good one to, to show off some of the complexities, even in a relatively simple environment, um, of having humans and machines, autonomous machines, together.